Section 24 Legends of the Hermit, men, so it was once said, make their own monsters, as well as their own heroes. Whilst not strictly true in a such a time as the Age of Strife, the human urge to mythologize the mysterious and the unbelievable is equally strong in this period, stories are traded amongst the star farers, or between huddled families, hiding in the dark and cold, or through the countless millions of refugee camps across the galaxy, whispered through dry lips. Into the ears of equally miserable or terrified people. Courts surrounding the Aflo and Petty Imperators were no different, uneasy rumors and tales passed as a subtle undertone throughout courtly proceedings. One of the most prevalent of these legends and myths is that of the Hermit, or the Six Hermits or the Wandering One. Depending upon which sector's stories you choose to listen to, variations of this rumored being crop up from the Segmentum Obscurus, all the way to the barter worlds of the Far Fringe, where human life is a mere commodity of various Xenos overlords. Though these tales often differ greatly, the infamous Hermit character seems to share several similarities. A large cowl or hood, obscuring his features, generally shabby clothes, piercing eyes, and often possessing miraculous, possibly warp-bound power. In the Segmentum Solar, the Hermit is an almost sort of folk hero. On the planet of Chinair, the Hermit came to the rescue of the Cinerian, when their overlord, a former Inquisitor calling himself Morvace, began to terrorize and oppress them terribly. The Hermit came, and within a few weeks, it was claimed, the entire planet was in revolt, as his oratory and word skills swayed the people against this false tyrant. The Inquisitor sent an entire battalion of soldiers to murder the Hermit, in his forest cave which he called home. The Hermit, using skill and his insane strength and speed, destroyed the entire army. The survivors fled, screaming Black Beast. Black Beast, haunted by the Hermit's form, at the height of the demonstrations. As the people united against Morves, and besieged his capital, the desperate Inquisitor unleashed his hardiest warriors. A twenty-strong band of marines malevolent. The callous, evil marines, butchered hundreds in their fury, driving amongst the crowd like mad zealots. Then came the hermit, hidden by the bulging crowd, he had managed to sneak into the capital unnoticed. As the marines prepared their final assault, he lunged forth, snatching the thunder hammer from the leader of the Astartes, and dashing his head from his shoulders, before laying into the other marines. As the marines were battled back, the crowds grew in courage, and charged the gates as one, smashing them from their hinges, and flooding the capital. Morvase was defeated, and the people cheered. However, the hermit was gone. Another world in the Segmentum Solar was attacked by the spoiled regiments from the Western Chaos Imperium who pulverized their capital, and demanded their surrender. However, a hermit had begun preaching a creed of salvation, of unification. Thus, the people rejected the devilish soldiers, who decided to punish the non-chaos imperials directly. The bat-winged apostle Grassis, the underlord of sector champion Kalos of the Chaos Imperium, descended on his dreadful pinions, leading the evil Cadians from the very front. However, when confronted, the people of the world were armed with fantastic weapons, fashioned by the hermit himself, and they held back the rampaging hordes. However, they could not vanquish Grassis, who merely laughed, as their flamers and hyper cannons merely rippled across his demoniacally invincible flesh. He slew thousands personally, his scythe reaping a bloody toll amongst the people. Then, when home seemed to fail, the hermit emerged. The demon and the hero wrestled, as the hermit battled the bad like horror from tower to tower. At last, the hermit unleashed a heavy blast from his flamer. Grassis laughed again, as the flames rippled across him harmlessly. However, that was never the intended target. Instead, the hermit melted the adamantine structure above the devil's head. As the beast laughed, the hermit seized him in the hold, and forced the molten super alloy down the monster's vile gullet. With a howl, the thing was banished, and the despoiled, leaderless, chose to fight to the death. The hermit didn't disappoint, as he and the defenders overran and slew them all, and so on, the stories go, across the entire Segmentum Solar and Pacificus. We can infer several interesting points about this hermit, from these many tales. Overall, he is phenomenally strong, able to wrestle a demon prince, and even tackle an adult amble in one of the legends of in it. He also is claimed to be a giant, anywhere from 90 foot tall, to roughly 7 foot. However, he generally seems to be nearing a start's height in most of these stories, and thus I feel confident in speculating that he is possibly some form of space marine renegade, whose deeds have been exaggerated, as all heroes are. In particular, this seems to be the modus operandi of the Salamander chapter, 
Since they shattered into nearly individual units after the Imperator fell, it is likely that perhaps these hermits are squads of salamanders, claiming to be a single mighty figure. The frequent depictions of the hermit being a black beast would seem to support this. The mysterious figure of the hermit seems to alter radically in the legends of Segmentum Obscurus. In these legends, he is a sinister being, who moves unseen through society, murdering and mutilating witches and sickers, seemingly at random. This makes this depiction particularly ambiguous. Sometimes the sickers in question are tyrannical puppet masters, dominating their mortal minions, and the hermit there is a liberator. Other times, however, he is merely shown to be a bizarre and crazy butcher, randomly murdering otherwise innocent sickers and witches, often dooming the planets in question. This hermit is not depicted as some giant, in fact often being depicted as a frail being by most accounts, but still seems to perform feats beyond a mortal. Such as removing all the air in a room to evade our bites, ripping a reaver titan in half even if the reaver in question was damaged, as the story suggests. The power needed to destroy something that large must be phenomenal, or killing with a gesture. I would tend to suggest that perhaps a group of intensely puritanical inquisitors, aided by significant resources, may be the source of the legend. One being surely couldn't be so powerful. The Ultima Segmentum has numerous hermit myths. In some he is armed, others unarmed. His cowl goes from deep blue or grey, through to bone white, or a deep blackened hue. His height fluctuates as much as his objectives. In the south, near to Grand Sicarium and the Alfian Pain conglomerate, the hermit seems to be a master huntsman, stalking wrongdoers with his hunting bow. These seem to merge eerily well with similar legends of Telian and his hooded company, and well could be a case of stories merging into an amalgam. The hermit being armed is often down to confusion on the part of the observers to events. How can a mortal tell the difference between a reaper soul, a watcher in the dark, fallen, or cowled warrior zealots? Especially during an intense firefight, the northern hermit seems completely non-violent, healing the ill and dying, and preaching word of the third path, the path of moderation. He she has never been associated with any warmongering activities. The northeastern hermit legends tell of a different tale, a lithe woman, cowled in shimmering cowls of black silk, as a widow. She brings death to any who do not pray to the emperor for his rebirth. Children are frightened by bedtime tales of the widow hermit, the cowled crone of the north. Thus, we can see that, perhaps, there is no one hermit, but perhaps several stories, overlapping and influencing each other, as the stories are retold, over and over. However, one thing upsets this theory. Almost unanimously, the tales have an element of destiny to them. No matter the local, no matter the local dialect or previous myths, each legend mentions the world named war, and how the hermit is traveling, slowly, towards this mythical place. How so many diverse cultures, many of which could not possibly contact each other, due to warp storms and lack of the astronomicon, came up with, word for word, the exact same phrase, over and over, suggests something disturbing. Especially in light of the events known to have occurred upon the planet of Armageddon. Section 25 of the Webway Wog. Distant rumbles are heard far distant from the journal author. Journal author gazes up at ceiling. As flecks of dust dislodge from ceiling. Journal resumes. Exchange of words between author and hooded figure in doorway. Figure exits. Apologies must be given to the tardiness of the latest input. Unforeseen assaults have begun upon the world of my order. The mercenaries we hired are dealing with the problem. So, I digress. The current status of my order is irrelevant to my rendition of the second age of strife. The journal shall resume now, covering a topic of much mystique and intrigue. It has been generally assumed that Waz Daka and his outriders, at the very start of this period, led all orcs in existence into epic conflict with the invincible forces of the new devourer, and were utterly annihilated in a war involving trillions upon trillions of orcs, and billions of new devourer beasts, as Waz Daka's forces lunged from his superhighway in a veritable tide. Of course, it would be a sweeping generalization to conclude this was universally the case. Though any orcs directly fighting the new devourer, were utterly destroyed, along with their spore-borne reproductive systems, some of the more primitive, scattered, and broken orc-infected world, survived. These were the worlds too far from combat, where only scant traces of orcoid fungus remain. However, orcs are nothing if not tenacious. These light patches of growth eventually bred orcs, and other variants of orcoid genus. Thus, scattered, primitive bands of feral orcs sprang up, along with the far more common Gretchen colonies. These orcs, however, were not the technologically advanced I just the term loosely. 
Their technology was as ramshackle as it was genius versions, which terrorized the 41st millennium. They were mild local threats, often dwelling in deep forests or swamp. They were the semi-mythical menace on the borders of civilization, and little else. In large numbers, they could perhaps overrun a small petty imperium, if they gained the element of surprise, but little else. Of course, there was also the infamous Bolt Boy, a war boss who terrorized the world of Armageddon, using the cunning and knowledge unlocked in his alien mind, via a bolt around to the brain. This war boss, upon sensing a call from Wyagras the supposed dad of Gork and Mork, led his entire warband away from the Octavian system, and the Armageddon system, and instead assaulted the maiden world of Force Katic Heretics he has Mudasterin or Pretty World to the Orcs. Of course, the famous Yerik, hero of Hades Hive and later, hated Butcher of Batek, but that shall be covered later, and a number of Black Templars, pursued him every step of the way. However, eventually the Orc's superior system of FTL, which didn't rely upon the Astronomicon, outpaced the Imperial, who became scattered by increasingly treacherous warp currents due to the dying Imperator of this period, as mentioned before. The Imperial Crusade to hunt him was shattered, and the separate elements never reformed again. Some of the least damaged vessels limped back to Armageddon, while others were smashed in the warp, or tossed to distant systems, far away, to be preyed upon and prey upon enemy shipping. Now, back to the warpers. The few Exodites living upon the pretty Exodite world were slaughtered and eaten after a relatively short campaign. Once conquered, the Warbus, Thraka the head wound, led his boys against the webway portals of the world, smashing the seals using brute force, and psychic assaults by his wit boys. Soon, his force had breached the webway, and began to travel inside the strange, almost frictionless realm. Corridors traveled to nowhere, or took you back in time, or turned to insane. Passages were too small for a single orc to fit in, yet whole gargants tripped over inside them. Buggies lost all grip to the ground, and crashed or smashed themselves to bits. Sometimes up wasn't up, but sideways, and time seemed to slow and speed up at random. After he lost almost half his number, it was said Thraka gave a sensible order to his orcs. Okay lads. Don't touch nothing, right? With a newfound, strange sense of caution, the orcs advanced. Many were the battles and wars they faced, as they hopelessly wandered the webway, battling Dark Elder raids, Bealtan strike forces, demons trapped within the warded labyrinth, or Ahriman's minion, who launched sorcerous blasts at the ragtag bands of orcs. Despite their caution, the labyrinth dimension still disorientated many, who wandered off on their own. Whole warbands and cults of speed, were simply lost in the webway. Some were killed, some continued to fight, oblivious to where they were. A good few orcs took wrong turns, and stumbled into starship-sized webway tunnels, only to be splatted by a passing void stalker or elder cruiser, as they sped through the tunnels. Towards their destiny, crystalline spiders became a very common foe, who tested the orcs' combat prowess to the limit. They were regenerative, deadly, and could merge with the walls themselves. Yet, despite all this anarchy throughout the labyrinth dimension, those orcs surrounding Thraka had wound, never seemed to get lost, as they battle through the webway, incorporating Wraithbone into their weapons, as their devices broke or were exhausted by constant combat. Something was calling him, across the realm, dancing. Colorful spectres teased and crew the orcs forward, ever elusive to the mindless violence of their quarry. Why Grasgale was calling, why Grasgale was listening. No evidence tells us what finally happened, when the orcs met their supposed overgod. However, after that point, the sightings of orcs blundering around the webway shrank to nearly zero. It is possible the god's call was a ruse by the Holoquins, who then murdered the orcs. Yet, this does not even come close to explaining why, on over 2000 separate occasions, strange, bulky shapes have emerged from the webway, killed entire settlements across the galaxy, seemingly at random, before returning to the webway. These strange things are said to be 8 feet tall, and covered with overlapping, crystalline armor, which glitters like organic flesh, and each being is said to be capable of flight, and could fire devastating blue energy from bulky, sturdy weapons. Now, of course, these depictions could be of new wraith constructs, or even simple fabrications by civilians with no concept of the strange beings of the universe. However, it is the fact these broad giants are led by frail, incredibly short beings, similarly attired, which unnerves me, along with the insanely perfect discipline of these warriors. That and their war cries, which sound suspiciously like another race of warmonger. However, these chants are more disciplined and perfect, and the race's name is different. 
Is it possible? Could the green skins really have always been merely the degenerative offspring of these K.R.? Another rumble rocks entire chamber. Journal is dislodged and topples to floor. Author picks up, dusting off. Distinct weapon discharge is audible. Journal shall resume in a few days. We must evacuate to a secure low level, and let the mercenaries deal with the problem. The foe should leave once our world passes under the glare of the blue star. For now, journal curtailed, will resume in approximately 4 Terran days. Journal is closed by author, as he runs for chamber door. Vox transcript beta 4 delta. Condit servitor 1 dx, servitor 4 dv. Transcript begins. Subject 1 we need assurances odor. We were promised results. Is the repulsion nearing completion? Subject 2 large detonation audible. Gunfire sporadic they're more persistent than before. Had to drag almost half my hosts around to repel them this time. We couldn't have known artillery would become an issue. Subject 1 it doesn't matter. We shall pay double, if you can repulse them as soon as possible. Our vaults are sealed. They can't get in, but my brethren need reassurances odor. Subject 2 growled. Subject 1 odor. Odor. Subject 2 yelling understood. Odor out. High volume detonations distinguishable. Section 26 of the Setan and the Ophilim Kyasos. Suggest someone ray copies this, as I've edited it to flow better previous edits left grammar screws and text holes, and have 90% less neckons. Though the most mighty of all the Setan, the Void Dragon, was roused and trapped within the solar system, due to Abaddon's devilish guile as we have already covered, this was far from the curtailing of the threat of the Star Gods, and their Silver Fiends. At the close of the 41st millennium, humanity at large was ignorant of these dread legions. They were mere myths, rumors, legends told by wary adventurers to the gullible of the foolish. Even those of the very highest power, the High Lords, the Adeptus Mechanicus, and the Inquisition, had only the mere inkling that the seemingly random attacks by metallic alien androids, were in fact, parts of a grander and more terrible threat. As the new Devara swept across the galaxy like a vile cancerous disease, the Necrons purged their tomb worlds of life, cunningly evading the predations of the new threat, which they weathered, as they have always weathered the storm. Then, the Astronomicon, over decades, spluttered and blinked out of existence, heralding the doom of the Imperator, and the disintegration of any semblance of unified galactic order, seemingly forever. Into this universe in turmoil, the Necrons were in a strong position. Their fleets and forces were independent of the warp, and could span the galaxy in mere days. Yet, the scattered Necron worlds, despite their dread might, were near automatons, simply reacting to events as they unfolded, utilizing pre-programmed responses. Some of the more delusional or insane Necron lords, driven utterly psychotic by the loss of their physical form, crafted grandiose Necrodermis bodies for themselves. These Necrons would override the nodal automated defense systems of their tomb worlds, and unleash the dreadful mechanical legions against whole sectors, slaughtering billions upon billions of innocents. Though these forces were sporadic and rare, word began to spread amongst the petty Imperiums of man. The Silver Phantoms were rising, exterminating all who stood in their path. Paranoia, already strained to breaking point by the various tensions and threats which were the norm during the Second Age of Strife, turned into outright lunacy as hearsay and superstition overturned reason and obedience. For instance, in 215 M44, the world of Illyris, in the Imperium of Null Quenta, destroyed all their servitors and machinery in a single month. During the destructive soul riots of that year, the terrified citizens murdered surf tech priests and engineers too, fearing the Admech were the source of these monstrous metal devil. Unfortunately, the world soon fell into desperate poverty and starvation, as the now machinery-free world found it could no longer support the 3 billion citizens. Who now starved and rioted in the streets? Wars sprang up between rival armies and gangs of starving people, who raided the processing factories and starports, desperate to find sustenance. Inevitably, cannibalism was rife, and meat orgies cropped up across the planet, where carnivals of degenerates would murder people in the street, and immolate them in vast bonfire. The Null Quinter Imperium, being a small and impoverished empire of only seven worlds, had too few vessels to spare to aid the planet, and soon the entire world died. This was an unforeseeable consequences of increased Necron activity. However, the fears of the general populace were misplaced. The Necrons were merely the servants, to the greater, unseen evil, directing the majority of the Necron race, like a puppet master plucks the strings off his charger, the Setan, the Dread Star Gods. Every race had their own legends regarding these fiends, but few believed in them, 
and thus, when the Necrons began to fully mobilize under their cold, heartless stares, the galaxy at large was largely unprepared for their rampages. Of the three Cetan abroad, the Dark Force known as the Reaper, was by far the most overt and blatant of the threats. While its grand rampage came late in the Second Age of Strife, occurring during M47, it was no less devastating for this. For millennia, the unloving servants of the Reaper had been brazenly gathering and capturing beings of psychic potential, and bringing them to the world of Tovinus, in the Ultima Segmentum. Though the Reaper made no secret of these attacks, there was no force which could prevent it from taking these potentials, as the self-interested and cowardly petty Imperium sought to protect themselves and fight their rivals, while the majority of the Xenos empires fought amongst themselves likewise. Or ignored this growing threat in the east in favor of expanding their colonial assets and the momentous power vacuum created upon the death of the Emperor. Thus, unimpeded in their battling work, the Necron Lords gathered these psychics together, herding them to the world in night shrouded vessels, under constant guard by hundreds of pariah cyborg. Upon this world, hundreds of captured tech priests, and dragon cultists fooled into believing the Reaper was, in fact, the Void Dragon, began work on a vast machine, an unholy meld of psychic technology, and necrontor artifice, crafted using Cetan knowledge of the physical. With domesticated Sicker's knowledge of warp craft and the endless toil of billions upon billions of mind-broken slave workers whipped into work by careless pariah, a great edifice was constructed, known as the Domfit. This device was colossal, easily covering the entire planet's surface, and tapering to a thousand-mile high spire, the apex and focus for the grand machine. It is a supreme irony that the largest warp engine ever constructed, was devised by a Zetan, as it loathed the realm it sought to breach. In M46, the Domfi was engaged, like a vast and blinding torch of psychic energy, it punched through the veil of unreality. The vast beam of conceptual nothingness surged through the sea of souls like a spear, ensnaring something, hidden deep within a warp fold, before dragging the thing out of the warp violently. Emerging slowly from the portal of madness, came the scythe of Keyless Ra, the great flagship of the Reaper's fleet. Yet, the entire Necron force was forced to retreat, as the warp spilled outwards like an avalanche of sense and madness. The Cetan knew nothing of how to control the warp, and the Reaper fled in hatred and loathing. Fearing the dreadful danger it posed to its forces and itself, Tovnis was consumed, as the Necron fleet surrounding the planet vanished in the blink of an eye, dragging their prize with them. Of Tovinus, it was doomed. The Domphir overloaded, spilling warp stuff across the world, and pulsing vile ethereal energies into the very core of the planet. The cowering tech priests and slaves were destroyed by demons formed from madness and woe. The Sickers were possessed and destroyed, paving the path for ever greater demons and monsters to be born. Within years, the warp consumed the planet, and at last, its core shattered, and it collapsed upon itself. There were no survivors. Yet, the Reaper had his prize, at last. After a century of purging and restructuring, the Cetan's warship was finally purged of any lingering warp stuff, and then it was ready. In 536 M47, the Reaper made its presence felt in grand style, spreading rapidly from the far northeastern sectors of the galaxy. The Reaper's war fleet purged systems and destroyed entire populations. While enslaving the rest to be later fed to the monstrous star god, Xeno civilizations would rise up to challenge his fleets, only to be shattered by the devilishly swift and lethal vessels of the Necrons, whose terrible arcs of eldritch lightning destroyed vessels with a mere flicker of their arcane energies. Xeno's homeworlds were simultaneously assaulted. As their fleets died in the void, their capitals were suddenly assailed by thousands of towering monoliths. Some of the great floating edifices were said to be as tall as mountains, emitting triumphant, sonorous horns, which blared across entire continents. As they unleashed millions of immortal Necrons from their ethereal portals, these were not the scant and mysterious Necron raiding forces of the 41st millennium. These were the full warhests of the Necrons. Multiple mile long columns of silver death marched wordlessly across the devastated planets firing their lethal green gorse weapons seemingly in unison at predetermined targets. In several volleys of combined gorse arcs, whole fortress cities were slagged, whole armies reduced to billowing ash, or smoking skeleton. Wraiths swarmed the skies and streets like silver clouds of incorporeal doom. Scarabs, like a moving carpet, destroyed anything which moved or breathed. Smaller monoliths followed these great phalanxes, their weapons just as devastating, and their payloads equally terrifying. Needless to say, these worlds were rapidly dominated by the Necrons. 
80% of all life upon these worlds were massacred in the first few weeks of occupation. The rest were enslaved, as the main host phased off the worlds, to rejoin the main Necron fleet, many remained upon these worlds, forcing the populations to construct towering statues in the name of the Reaper, and massive shimmering machines, reminiscent of the arcane devices upon Farbas, fed humans into them, thus being broken down into energy, and pulsed directly into the scythe of Kelis Ra, directly enriching the Reaper with their energies. It was claimed that within three years, six sectors were cleansed of resistance, and virtually all life exterminated. Within a decade this area of devastation soon bordered upon the Thexan trade empire, which pulled thousands of its vessels and millions upon millions of its mercenary troops, slave soldiers, and professional Telerian armed soldiery, from the TAU front, in an attempt to curb the Reaper's relentless, systematic advance. The Thexan war machine. Hardened by long and bitter border wars, and financed by the double-dealing Thexan elite, was a formidable force. The Ulthian Bone Eaters, employed specialist trans-phasing torpedoes, which used miniature warp teleporters to teleport within enemy vessels, detonating inside. These were effective against even the godlike Cairn-class Necron vessels, blasting them from within. The Ellison Colosine, vast grey juggernauts built by the Gongolum, also held their own against the Immortals. Using their powerful antimatter cannons and scavenged Dark Lance technology to great effect, yet, for all their resources and manpower, the Thexan Trade Empire could only slow the relentless forces of the Reaper. Whenever there was a prolonged stalemate between navies, the side of Keyless Ra would arrive to break the stalemate. The vessel was vast and terrible beyond comprehension. On the planets, even the divert and deadly forces of the Trade Empire couldn't vanquish the legions of Necrons, which swept all before it. On the world of Tatizen, it was said an entire Krieg Surf battalion marched directly into open combat with the Necron host. Scouring green arcs of malevolent gorse energy played across the battlefield, destroying them within minutes. Yet, never once did the Krieg falter. They marched fearlessly to their dooms, firing their lasguns, as they chanted ancient Krieg war hymns through the dark respirator masks. Several of the less important colonies were evacuated wholesale. The Thexan Empire needed workers for its monstrous capital-based society, and it couldn't allow the Necron legions to bleed them dry in this manner. In most cases, the evacuations occurred just before the Necrons arrived, yet some cases, like that of Herosa, were too slow, as the starport of the single city upon the world became flooded with desperate, fleeing citizens. The dark, crescent shadows of the Necron vessels loomed at the darkening, discolored skies. A great whale erupted from the predominantly surf human populace, as they floundered to get upon the last transport, as it idled in the port's docking bay. People bit and tore and found, as they all desperately surged towards their final hope of salvation. With grave regret, the Actonian pilot engaged the thrust systems, and the ship slowly rose from the port, the backwash of its engines boiling away hundreds of civilian, too slow or too weak to fight their way aboard, yet, on the horizon. Stabbing spears of luminescent energy stabbed from the sky, signaling the teleportation of four monoliths onto the surface, mere hundreds of meters from the port. Sure enough, the towering machines hovered into view, their arcing weaponry was drawn along the mass of planet-bound humans, scything them down like a reaping machine across a wheat field. Within moments, the monoliths would be finished with the planet bound, and were detargeting the single transport, which climbed agonizingly slowly into the sky. Just then, springing from its hiding place amidst the rubble of the ruined city, emerged the bulky form of vengeance, a Krieg Bane blade, representing the last of the military forces upon Herosa. Its cannons blazed, as the Super Heavy drove towards the monoliths. In its first salvo, a lucky hit struck a monolith in its crystal nexus, detonating the A-line death machine with a throaty roar. Gorse arcs and particle projectors fired upon the tank, blasting off panels, burning the crew, and pulverizing its wearing innards. Yet, the machine spirit, outraged at the mere existence of the diabolical Necrons, continued, pushing the vehicle forwards at an ever faster pace. Necrons began to emerge from the closest monolith, as the Bane Blade closed a gap betwixt them. The skeletal nightmares were ground under track, as the vehicle finally slammed into the machine, simultaneously firing its demolisher cannon, directly into the alien machine. The two vehicles exploded spectacularly, with the tank's sacrifice, the transport escaped, and the world it left behind was utterly slain. Similarly hopeless situations were repeated, across dozens of worlds, hundreds of battlefields. 
The situation became so desperate that the Thexans began to make overtures to nearby empires and conglomerates. Some, such as the Nihilist League, openly murdered their representatives to show how little they cared for the duplicitous Thexans. Amazingly the TAU the most powerful local faction in the eastern fringe did agree to send troops and supplies to their old foes. This was in exchange for the Thexans agreeing to join the TAU Empire. Grudgingly, the Thexans accepted in later years, they broke away from the TAU, and the second Thexan TAU wars began, but that is beyond the scope of this background section. TAU vessels and material flooded across the neutral borders between the two local empires. Though distrustful, the two forces worked together well, held together by the mercenary professionalism of the Thexan forces, and the technological powerhouse of the TAU Empire. Even more fortunately for the Allies, the TAU had discovered a form of advanced decanon technology, upon the dead world of Janus, a few hundred years before the invasions of the Reaper. Some said mysterious and colorful aliens had left the weapons there, and this chronicler could well believe this in light of the Harlequin's activities across the galaxy at that time. Even the relatively intact Iron Lord's chapter of Space Marines, usually so aloof and disdainful of aliens, aided the Xenos war effort, by directing the Bargisi, their main foe, against the Necrons. This was not due to kindness or camaraderie with the Thexans. However, Master Hot of the Iron Lords, secretly hoped the Bargisi and Necrons would destroy each other. As it turned out, the Bargisi were able to deeply challenge the Necrons on the battlefield, due to their hyper-violent and destructive biologies. Yet were unable to overwhelm the immortal forces of the Star God. Using these new allies, weapons, and the sheer manpower of the combined Thexan TAU empires, the Necrons were halted, and the Reaper forced to consolidate his forces. The first Setan incursion was curbed, but at a terrible cost. Of course, throughout the thousands of years of the Reaper's preparations for epic warfare, the Lying God was abroad and active for far longer, and far more covertly. Across the galaxy, from M44 M49, nearly 70 petty Imperiums, independent human secession colonies and Xenos enclaves, were approached by mysterious emissaries. From the so-called Rhiney conglomerate more vigilant readers can see the obvious implications of the title, I'm sure. These smiling human orators, in their simple silver garbs, offered advice and or military and social aid to the governments of these various empires. However, their advice was venom disguised as sage wisdom. These messengers fed false information to the gullible leaders of these petty empires. Some were guided to attacking Exodite worlds, killing thousands of innocent elder in the process. Some tricked empires into conflict with one another, or turned them against the ancient warrior races. Covertly, the messengers sent disguised Necrons deep within enemy territories, spreading lies, misinformation and rumor, as well as snatching those sentient beings considered worthy of conversion to the next phase of Setan warrior constructs, the Pariah Cyborg. In some cases, covered Necron cells would clash with other espionage-centered organizations. In darkened streets, Alpha Legionnaires, Spies, Brigands, Assassins, and Silver Fiends, clashed silently and brutally. The Lying God set traps and fabrications across the galaxy, seeking to ensnare Araman or one of his coven, eager to learn the secrets of entering the webway, and punishing his ancient nemesis. Not only this, but a mysterious man calling himself Simply Relay, went abroad in the galaxy, asking any settlement he came to, where he could find an Inquisitor's Evoc. Yet, the very worst of the liar's machinations occurred late in the period, leading a band of Necrons, through the grim blockage around the gates of Val, the deceiver passed through the incomprehensible portal. None can say for sure what it fashioned in that dark and dreadful region. Perhaps it crafted it, or maybe merely used the power afforded by the inverse sun at the center of the galaxy to awaken it. Whatever it did, it had awoken and unleashed the Ophilim Kyasos. I can name this terror easily, but this is because my order researched the old tales, the legends that were legendary among Stephen the Elder. Mercenaries and bounty hunters were hired to search the haunted corpse craft worlds, and find the scriptures, the psychically active manuscripts of the old elder of the first ones themselves. It spoke of a war, the Inge, the great cane bloody handed, the Azurian, the ancient gods, the Cyclopean hordes, mirror devils drowning the gardens of paradise in silent death, the puppet masters, seeping through the cracks in sanity. These legends were self-contradictory and metaphorical in the extreme, they were as abstract as they were dreadful in their implications. One passage informed us of what spread from the gates, the great net, cast by the hunter Kernus, a black net, forged with Vol's magics, and Cain's hatred. Subverted, driven into a new form, this black net was known as Kyasos. 
Yet, when it was cast upon the Inga known as Avila, the Breaker, the Inga star hungry wriggled free, and cast the net into the wasteland, the realm beyond the realm, the place where the Ophilim, the godless ones, resided. Such was the grim artifice present in the Chiasos, it ensnared the greatest of the Ophilim, and drove it mad. Even Cain feared to touch the black net, as the rending horror thrashed like a mad thing. When the war ended, and the other realms finally sealed off the outer realm, the realm not of the ether and not of the other realms, was sealed too, as was the Ophilim Chiasos. Until the second age of strife, countless millions of years later, reports vary on the appearance of the foul force. All that is known is that, when the Ophilim enters a system, all things die, and the star at its heart withers like a rotten fruit. Ships which escape, claim it cannot be seen, though others say it can be seen only by the stars in the sky it obscures. Is it machine, or is it living? We cannot know. How the deceiver roused and or tamed the thing, we also cannot know. All we can know is that it is free, and it is something wrong. I have already said too much I fear, for this log was not intended to look to the future of our universe, but to document the horror of these past 10,000 years of hell. I have barely touched upon the great orb of the mad one. But I fear if I were to continue, I should drive myself mad. Suffice to say, as dreadful and hateful as the second age of strife has been for all of us, cowering from the monsters at our door, at least it is living. No matter how wretched life is, it is still life. Long may our misery continue, but if it means we survive the coming shadow, falling upon our galaxy once more, a man enters, carrying a sensor. The author waves him out, there is an argument, the sensor bearer leaves. Extract ends. If you haven't already check out my Redbubble portfolio, you might just find something you like. Just stop! Just stop it! Stop! No! Just stop it! It's time to stop! It's time to stop, okay? No more! Protective Services. It's time to stop!